right, sweet. This week we get to talk about, uh, well, I've called it the startup pitch, and also it's assignment three. Uh, I might just kick on. You guys never have any questions, so let's keep going. I need coffee. All right, cool. So um, this is what I want to go through today. After the break, we've got essentially sort of four, it's basically four weeks, three, three weeks to go um, between now and the end. I'll talk about assignment two as well, but assignment three would be most of the stuff we covered today. Um, and then I want to go through the investor memo or the memorandum, like what it is. And essentially, it's kind of like a business plan written down, but for a startup, so slightly different. And it, it can include elements that you would have had in your first assignment, like a business model canvas, but it's, a lot of the time it, it doesn't actually have that kind of, that kind of tool in it. It's more of, a, more of a business document. So assignment three, so this is the big one. So it includes the MVP or an extended MVP. And I'll talk about that. And then uh, the investor memo, which is kind of like a startup pitch. Now, originally, I was also going to get you guys to present and actually do a pitch, but that's not part of it anymore. But essentially what it, because I thought there was, there was, it looked like there were going to be too many people in the class and we wouldn't be able to get through it all, but actually we probably could have done it because there's only three of you in here. But anyway... Um, you'll see like a lot of the stuff I'm talking about today is like an, an investor memo or an IM, the shorthand, and shorthand for investor memo. But they go kind of hand in hand with like the startup pitch, so you're trying to pitch your idea. So usually when you get to this point and you're, you're writing one of these, you're at a position where you might want to go into an incubator or you might want to try and get investment money. And to do that, you need to communicate your idea and your business model, like the entire business really effectively. So that's the exercise. It's basically getting you guys to articulate a, a full breadth of your business model over and above what you did in assignment one. So assignment one was sort of like testing the waters, figuring out what your what your um, key assumptions were. To get to the next point, you need to have proved some of those assumptions and made real progress towards some of the things that you said in your first assignment. Like, you know, if if you were saying, well, like an element of my content strategy needs to be X, Y, Z, then in your next MVP you know, you should have had a go at actually executing some of that content or if you, or if part of it was about around, you know, your revenue strategy or pricing, then you should have had a go at setting some of those things up and actually trying to do it. So it's sort of like the next phase, if you will. <clears throat> so the detail behind it, is that thing on my screen? Oh, anyway. Um, so the investor memo, so it's uh, 4,000 words maximum, 4,000 words. Um, it can come under that if you articulate, if you are, can articulate it effectively. But when you see the detail that you need to go into, you'll probably need all 4,000 words would be my prediction. So you can follow, in terms of the structure, you can follow the, the examples I'll give you. So I'll give you examples and I'll give you a structure. You can follow that. Or you could follow your own structure as long as it's logical. But I'd recommend at least starting with the structure I give you before you go off and sort of change it. All of your business ideas are, are, in, are unique, so you probably will need to tailor elements and say, all right, this bit isn't as relevant for me, but I need another section called X, and that's fine. Um, some of the examples I'll give you have financial modeling in them. You don't have to do any of that, because that's just too much work, and it's not within the scope of the course. Um, so it needs to be of a standard you would give to an investor. So if you wouldn't, there's a hanging sentence there. If you wouldn't do that, then don't give it to me, essentially. So it needs to be something you'd be willing to hand over to someone outside of a university. Say you're going for a job and they ask you to put together a business model. It would need to be of that standard. Um, and it needs to cover all the aspects of the business model, not just a couple of different elements. So in the first assignment, I said, well, you can focus on, say, your value proposition, your customer segments, and your channels. Whereas this also needs to include, you know, your, your revenue model, your cost structure, other the, the entire entirety of your business model. So if, for example, in assignment one, you didn't really go into to the depths of, say, your pricing, then in the, this assignment, in your investing memo, you, you're going to need to. Or say your sales strategy, if you, if you have an advertising 
um, revenue model you need to have a go at using some of the information I gave you last in the last session to actually have a go at building up, you know, building a sales strategy around your advertising, for example. What are you going to sell on what basis, what inventory, all of that sort of stuff. You don't have to include the business model canvas if you don't want to, but if you found it useful, then you can. Um, and you'll find when I get into the structure that I recommend, some of those things are basically like exactly the same. Some of the elements are almost, you know, structurally exactly the same. And one of my key marking criteria is progress on assignment one. So can I see a demonstrable improvement, progress of validated learning on your business? Validated learning, going back to the lean startup methodology that we covered at the start of the semester. So when I look at, you know, what you produce for assignment one and the progress you made on your MVP, and also the learnings that you've got out of your MVP, how much progress have you made from point, point A to point B? Now, uh, one caveat on that is if you decide that you, the idea that you put forth in assignment one was really bad and you know why, and you want to do something else, then that's okay. I just need to be able to see that that was a validated learning experience, but I doubt that anyone's going to do that. I doubt you'll, you'll probably just continue with your first um, ideas. The MVP needs to be more of a reflection of the business described in your investor memo. So for some of the assignments, for example, um, one assignment, uh, one of the, the girls did some market research. So she interviewed a bunch of potential uh, people in her primary customer segment to get insights around what the business model should look like and presented them wireframes and, you know, just a mock-up. The MVP for the next phase needs to be more of a reflection of your actual business. So if it's a content-led business, there needs to be content in there that you know would reflect what that business actually is trying to do in market. Um, and again, progress on the initial MVP. So that the MVP should be a reflection of the, the learning that's in that you've managed to translate in your investor memo over to me. Sort of already covered that apart from that second point there so if in your first assignment you outline next steps or key assumptions that still needed to be tested then progress towards testing those assumptions should be your imperative so i can see all right this is what i don't know which was in assignment one this is what i don't know about the business model in assignment three i should be able to see that you've made progress towards some form of validation of those things cool all right let's get into it so an investor memo or memorandum. So in America, they call it a memo. We, over here, we call it a memorandum for some reason. It's just a term. There's like a pretty good article from an Aussie app development company about, you know, building a, building good in IMs, uh, at the link at the bottom there. Um, when, when I first started trying to raise money, so all, all of the documents I'll show you today and the strategies my business partners and I have managed to raise two and a half million dollars using them. So they do work. Or it works to a point. It's just a document. You also need to actually physically get in the room with these people and you know convince them to give you money. But when I first, you know, heard about them, I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that this is how you communicate startups concepts to investors. Um, so yeah, don't worry too much if it's all a bit new. Um, they're usually 20 to 30 pages. Sometimes they can be more. Um, and they highlight the most important aspects or, and opportunities of your business. Um, in reality, most people that you give this to wouldn't sit down and read it cover to cover. I'll obviously do that because I'm marking it. But what will probably happen is when you go and pitch your ideas, a startup pitch, and we'll, we'll have a look at some startup pitches. Just popcorn on the ground. Um, some startup pitches later on. Usually, if you're in a room with someone, you've got, say, 10 minutes, and you pitch them your idea and say, hey, that was, you know, this is my idea, talk, talk it through, and then you say, here's my IM, so that when they're trying to refresh their memory, or if, they, if they're unclear about a certain part of your business model, they can flick to that point and just have a look at it. That's why it's, they're sort of structured the way that they are. <clears throat> and it has more of the detail around, the, you know, the, the elements of your business model that you couldn't possibly get over without just getting really boring in a pitch. So in a pitch you're trying to be emotive and say, hey, there's this big problem out there in the world and I'm going to solve it with X. 
in a pitch like that, you don't want to get then get into the detail and say, well, actually, you know, I've really thought about our pricing and, you know, the optimal point in our pricing is X because of a bunch of market research that we did, you know, X, Y, Z over the past year and that's got us to this point. You don't have to, you don't want to say any of that in your pitch, but you need to get that across to an investor or to someone who's considering your business, whether it's, you know, a partner, if you're trying to partner with someone, these are really good documents, which we use. We use our document outside of investors as well, just as a way to, like we've got a new starter working in our business today and that's the best document to give him to say, this is what we're about. Go and read this, <laughs> you know. Um, so for this assignment, it can be in Word or it could be in a series of PowerPoint slides if you want. I don't really care. Cool. So this is a loose structure or outline that you can potentially follow. As I said before, you may decide that the flow needs to be different. As long as it feels logical to you and to me, then that's fine. Um, except the executive summary should also go at the start, obviously. And if you need other sections, just put them in. So that's sort of 13 sections. Now the last one, financial requirements, you guys don't have to do that because you're not actually raising money. If you are raising money, and I'll talk about this next week, what you actually do and some of the elements of that, but for this assignment, you, are, you don't have to include that. You can if you want to, if you're confident, but don't, book, don't worry including it if you don't want to. That's where you basically go to them. Look, we've, we've looked at all the numbers and we think we need half a million dollars to get us to you know, 12 months down the road where we will have learned X, Y, Z, where we can raise some more money or whatever it is. And then you also outline how much of the company that they get for giving you money and what the terms of the investment are and all of that sort of stuff. So I'll go through these in detail. Actually, before I do that, so you see some of these are um, are similar to what you guys did before, or they incorporate different elements of the business model canvas. Um, and also, you don't have to put them in this order. So, uh, the team section, sometimes it goes at the front. Uh, in our ones, we always put it at the back. We kind of felt like it should always be the product comes first, like what is your actual business product or service. Um, technology number six doesn't have to go in there unless there's something proprietary about the technology that you're using. So either a tech startup would put that there or say um, if you've got a, a key component of IP that's part of your business, then you put it in, but otherwise you don't need to put it in. Cool. So if you follow these, the executive summary, if you've never written anything like that, you've all written a thousand essays and you know a lot of you are journalists. So um, that's the snappiest, best summary you can make of the entire document within 200 to 400 words. Sometimes it's, it's shot over to someone before they get the full document. Um, it's pretty common to have an executive summary. In the context of this, it's, it's just getting to the key points, summarizing everything as quickly as possible and making it as sound as exciting as possible as quickly as possible. Um, in terms of the team, you need to outline, or you should outline, who's involved in the business, what experience do they have, and the reasons why they can execute the plan that you've, that you've outlined. In the context of you guys, if you're not confident about that section, just put it at the back, but you should probably still put it in, even if it's just you. Um, for the reasons of obviously, so, so you've got context, like that's where you would put potentially, if you're a part of a business, you might have an advisor working with you, or you might have advisors, you put them in there as well, you know. I don't have the, basically saying, I don't have the experience, I haven't done this before, but I'm working with someone who has. And that's where you put that information there. It's kind of like a reference sheet almost. Um, then the problem, you state the problem in simple language and if you need to contextualize it technically, you need to do, that, do it really quickly. Um, and then the solution. So this is where you actually ram home what your product and your product, service or business positioned as the solution to the problem relative to your competition. So you can inc include your competition if you can demonstrate how they're missing a segment of the market or if you can demonstrate how they're not doing something as well as you say that they should be or potentially you are. So you say, you know, this media company serves this segment in this way, but my content strategy or my sales strategy capitalizes on on this part of the market that they aren't, they aren't getting. Maybe they're too big and they don't bother about it. 
you know, maybe they can't serve that niche audience well enough because they don't have the context, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and you can include, if you're going to include the value proposition work that you've done, that's where you would put it in. Now, traction, um, I'll share with you a document. I put it on Slack a couple of days ago, but I'll put it on Moodle as well by a company called Venture Hacks. They run an online portal called AngelList, which is basically just startups around the world list themselves on there. They have a document that's basically, you know, how to pitch and how to build a case. And they say traction is the number one most important thing in any startup story ever. So if you've got traction, nothing else you say matters. Like they don't, it won't even matter what you say. So if you've got real traction in terms of, you know, people paying you money or people saying they'll pay you money or if you've pre-ordered something, you know, in a Kickstarter campaign, something like that, that's the most important thing in any startup story at all. To the point where if you've got traction, it doesn't matter who's on your team, doesn't matter if you've got massive flaws, it means that you've found some form of what they call product market fit and that's what they look for. So that's why the process of building an MVP and working on it and constantly improving it and validating your learning is so important because when you go out and communicate your business, or communicate your idea, it's so much more powerful to say, hey, this is what, this is how my product or business or service is um, unique in the market or positioned well, and here's proof that what I'm saying is in total bullshit in the form of people paying me money or you know, customers that have come on board and said, yeah, I'm keen for this or customer feedback, anything like that. So I've put like a, <coughs> a lot like the news hierarchy, if you guys are familiar with that, did you cover that in the course? So the news hierarchy is basically, and they say, you know, what, what constitutes news? Um, which is, I mean, you guys will probably know this, we all kind of know this. Like if someone, you know, a cyclone happens and a bunch of people die, that's news. That's like high order news. If someone says, like if a cyclone is about to happen, then that's sort of second order because it hasn't actually happened, but it, but it might happen. If someone says that something's going to happen, like a cyclone, then that's sort of the next level down. And then at the bottom is like gossip and, you know, hearsay and conjecture and opinion. It's a hierarchy. But in a hierarchy, you know, startup hierarchy, basically when you're trying to communicate it, it's basically someone is paying you money for what you're trying to do and or you've got an audience there that someone's willing to get access to and they're paid to get access to it. Um, someone says that they'll pay you or someone's pre-ordered something or someone's signed up. People reading your content or sign up comes last in that traction list because of the two-sided marketplace element. The easy part is getting the audience, the hard part is selling it in digital media. And after that comes your product build, technology, team, etc. I already covered the technology part, so I won't, um, I won't uh, dwell on that. Apart from saying, like, if you do want to include the technology that you're you're going to leverage based on what you've seen in the class in the um, semester, and also anything else you find, then feel free to list it there. Even though you guys, a lot of the ideas aren't specific technology startups, you can still list it there if you want to. Cool. So then the market. So this is where you need to articulate the scope of your market. So how big is it? What's it worth in dollar terms and how many people are in it? Um, how do you actually address that market? So the market can be large and you can have segments within that. So you can say, look, it's, you know, the Australian media, digital media industry might be, you know, this big, I'm only going after this much of it at the moment. So my the segment that I'm currently targeting, but then also potential future segments you might go after. The next really important thing, which often gets left off, is the future growth of that market. People are going to take a bet on what you're doing, then you need to be able to demonstrate that that market is either, you know, already very large, and you can address it in a slightly different way, like the Airbnb story, you know people moving around and staying in hotels wasn't growing, they just changed the dynamic of that market. Or you can demonstrate that it's going to grow and it is, has the potential to be very large, the potential to, so growth potential in a market. <clears throat> so 
So why is it going to be large, larger than it already is, or you know, already huge, but we just don't know about it, or it might be slightly different. The other um, component which I'll mention there in the market is timing. So, what, and this is sort of, this is important to note across the spectrum of, you know, what you're trying to communicate. And I'll show a video on this at the end, is um, why is now, and I've had this question from VCs when I've spoken to them, is why is now a good time to do what you're doing? Like, why is now the time? And having a solid response to that or re reasoning behind why, you know, the market is ready now or um, in the video he gives an example of Airbnb actually launched in the middle of a recession. So it was great because, or well, this is post, post, um, post rationalizing it, but his argument was people were willing to overcome the thought of a stranger staying in their house because it was a recession, they needed extra cash. And that was the timing argument. <coughs> the competitive context, so how are they structured and how can you compete against them? And you can do that in a positioning map, if you've ever seen a positioning map. You guys ever seen one of those? No? I'll show you one quickly. They're very simple tools. It's not. It's nothing complicated. 